Sitcoms and dramas have gotten a lot of mileage out of the rivals trapped together that have to bond to survive trope, and for the first five minutes it looks like that's what this is. Instead we get a meditation on how the characters deal with tragedy and grief and an acting clinic from several members of the cast. Bobby is getting increasingly frustrated with Pamela's duties at the store, constantly coming in between Pamby time. He has to catch a flight with JR and promises that they will talk later. Interesting that Bobby is gallivanting all over the Gulf of Mexico, but it's Pam whose job is getting in the way. I realize Bobby makes considerably more money than Pam, but maybe multi-million dollar Ewing oil should be run by more than two people? Seriously, the office is 50% administrative assistant. JR is also frustrated, but it's with Bobby over cutting him out of a meeting with Charlie Cox. Bobby says it was a Ewing construction meeting, which means it's his meeting. I guess JR is just as anxious as we are for a fourth season of Daredevil. The pilot tells them that there's nasty weather ahead, but JR insists that they make their meeting. You never listen to anybody, do you, JR? You have to run everything. You handle your company the way you control your wife. You and construction's in a lot of trouble. Yeah, he should really get Pam under his thumb, you know, the way JR does with Sue Ellen. Sue Ellen goes to see JR's arch nemesis, Cliff Barnes, who tells her that even if he could find Rita, the mother of her child from Black Market Baby, Sue Ellen couldn't legally adopt the baby without JR's consent. Yeah, it would be totally unfair to force someone to have a baby if they didn't consent to it. Meanwhile, Jock's old coot of a doctor tells Jock to take it easy for Ellie's sake. But Jock is feeling emasculated. And Ellie is still worried. Liz Craig offers to take Pam for a spa day, but Pam wants to hop a flight and see Bobby for some makeup time. Jock laments that the household is out of control. Lucy's at home, Pam's gone, it's anarchy! On the plane, Bobby and JR bond over how they can't bond. It may be too little too late though, as the electrical goes out and the plane goes down. I know they should have picked Sam Piper over Aeromass. The airport calls Ellie and tells her that the plane went off the radar. Ellie is distraught, but goes into full boss mode, organizing the communication response team of Ray and Lucy, and coming up with a conspiracy to ensure Jock doesn't find out. You know what? I was wrong before. Ewing Oil doesn't need a third person in the office. They just need to hand it all over to Ellie. Ray collects Pam from the airport, where she apparently was supposed to meet Victor Laszlo. Sue Ellen's business meeting with Cliff nearly turns into a nooner before Sue Ellen learns that she's being called back to the ranch. <laughs> Pam tells Sue Ellen when she arrives, and Sue Ellen is still hostile. Perhaps some guilt leaking through. There was a storm. Bobby and JR were taking the plane, and it went down the Cato Swamp. That night, Jock and the Ewing women have an awkward dinner during which Pam nearly spills a secret. Um, uh... Cliff had an abortion! Lucy tries to call Gary to tell him to come home and wait for his brothers, but Sue Ellen hangs up the phone and accuses her of trying to horn in on the Ewing fortunes. I'm not money hungry like you are, Sue Ellen. You brat! That you're real sorry that you don't have a little brat of your own like me, because if JR is dead, Without a child, you'll never have South Fork. The press finds out that the plane went down and a reporter tries to call Ellie for a comment. Ellie hangs up on him and tells Ray to go to DEFCON 1. Ray organizes the ranch hands but tells them not to go out armed. What kind of alternate dimension Texas is this? Pam wanders in on Sue Ellen getting drunk. Sue Ellen vents to Pam about being nothing except for Mrs. J.R. Ewing. And if he's dead, which she assumes he is, that's the end of her. Interestingly, this is exactly how Pam described her back in Black Market Baby. We didn't marry another Sue Ellen. Sometimes I get the feeling if JR didn't exist, she'd just disappear into a puff of smoke. Sue Ellen drunkenly slobbers that Pam will also be out on the street getting men to pay her bills again. Nobody ever paid my bills! I worked in a job just the way I'm doing now! What did you ever do?! Of course, being Pamela, she offers a tearful Sue Ellen a sympathetic hand, and Sue Ellen tells her that she'll have nothing. The reporter from earlier makes the mistake of knocking on the door and trying to get a quote from Ellie. Do you know what we do to vultures out here, Mr. Jackson? Ray, get me the shotgun out of the whole closet. Ellie doesn't want to be fed. Ellie wants to hunt. The reporter scurries off, but the damage is already done as Jock overheard the whole thing. Warning. A tearful Jim Davis will wreck your whole damn morning. Ellie admits she thought the shock would be too much for his heart, but Jock tells her that she doesn't have to coddle him or handle it all alone. Jock sends Ray out in the Ewing copter to search for the boys and bring them back, dead or alive. With Jock tagging in on central operations, 
Ellie has the chance to release and mourn with Pamela. She tells an endearing story about how shy JR was as a kid and how he wouldn't let go of her because Jock used to scare him. Then, when Gary came along, Jock took over raising JR to make a man out of him. So there you go. JR has been chasing Jock's ideal of manhood all his life, so it's no wonder he's so ruthless and capitalistic. Ellie says that's why she focused so much on Gary. Gary was more Southworth than Ewing, so he was always getting into trouble with Jock. And when Bobby came along, they just gave him everything he wanted. That all makes sense in retrospect. More on that later. The next day, Jock is tense, but not so tense that he can't run down Gary in front of Lucy. He had his chance, Lucy, and walked away. Hey, I get it. Even the boom mic operator isn't having his best day. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ray is having difficulty finding Bobby and JR in the swamp, presumably because they're not teenage girls. <laughs> okay, last joke about that. We get a view of some wreckage and the disembodied voices of Larry Hagman and Patrick Duffy, who definitely were there in the swamp on location. You don't have to look that up, just trust the magic of Hollywood. Who else would Ray have been waving to? Anyway, the Ewings are all reunited, and Ellie thinks that they can start being a family again. Survival is a sharp right turn away from the intrigue and political machinations of election. It barely feels like the two episodes are part of the same show, but that adds to the excellent work of the ensemble cast. The show is really starting to hit its stride at this point. Larry Hagman and Patrick Duffy are only in this episode for approximately five minutes of screen time before turning it over to the rest of the cast. And this is where you see just how strong all of the other actors are. Barbara Bel Geddes was, of course, a longtime star of stage and screen, appearing most notably as Midge in Alfred Hitchcock's masterpiece Vertigo. So a performance of this caliber was not exactly a surprise from her. It is still a sight to behold, though. Ellie's steely-eyed glare through Jackson the Reporter is an all-time classic. Her second of the season after her rah-rah speech in Old Acquaintance. But this performance is fantastic from top to bottom. I particularly love the way she presses her tongue to the roof of her mouth, one of the sheer micro-expressions of being overstressed. It's a small but noticeable act from an expert at her craft. Jim Davis, who always had a respectable resume, but not quite up to Bel Geddes, turns in an equally good performance in the small amount of time he's on screen. The running storyline throughout the second season is Jock's struggle with his masculinity after bypass. Each episode so far has made sure to include a scene in which Ellie dotes on him like a child. Uh, Jock, the doctor said not to concern yourself with business. For someone for whom traditional manhood is so important, it's understandable how this is a rough adjustment for Jock. This will pay off a bit later, but I really enjoy how Jim Davis plays the frustration. Jock's tearful look toward Miss Ellie when he overhears the reporter about the boy's disappearance is a jumble of sorrow and hurt and helplessness, and it's difficult not to shed a tear as a viewer during that scene. The younger generation is also up to the task here, with Victoria Principal and Linda Gray also turning in great performances. Sue Ellen continues her tragic and complex arc as a woman who is beginning to realize that the deal she made with the devil for money and power isn't as glamorous as it seemed. She does have the money and the status, but it's come at the expense of her self-concept and self-esteem. There are three parts to one's persona, or self, and if any one of them is lacking or unclear, it can cause a great deal of strain and weariness. Self-awareness is the ability to recognize where one's thoughts and feelings are coming from. And this seems to be something that Suellen consistently denies, at least outwardly. At the very least, she doesn't seem confident in her string of denials about her disappointing marriage or jealousy of Pamela. Self-concept refers to the label one puts on oneself. It's the idea of who you are. An oil tycoon, a father, a matriarch, an all-around good guy. In this episode, Sue Ellen admits that she has no idea who she is outside of J.R. Ewing's wife. I was just sitting here counting my blessings. You know what? They all add up to J.R. She's buried herself so deeply in that identity that her relationships with the other Ewings have remained at the surface level. What the hell is it? It's an antique. by an Italian sculptor. I thought it'd look nice in the den. It's Pamela who Miss Ellie confides in on the porch. Without JR, who is Sue Ellen? Finally, self-esteem is the overall value one assigns to themselves based on their perception of how far away they are from an idealized version of themselves. I'll try to talk about the multiple components of this in For Love or Money, but suffice it to say, Cliff Barnes's interest in Sue Ellen is more than just a plot point for Cliff. It's clearly stirring something more in her than just her loins. For the first time, she's being presented with a window into a world without Mrs. J.R. Ewing. 
And that has to be terrifying. Because if JR is dead, without a child, you'll never have South Fork. All of this would seem to be reading too much into a glorified one-off episode. If the episode didn't come from the sure pin of longtime TV writer DC Fontana. Fontana is mostly known for being one of the longtime writers of the Star Trek franchise. The original series, The Next Generation, and Deep Space Nine. But she wrote for several series before, in between, and since. Fontana was hired as a secretary out of college and bounced from Hollywood office to Hollywood office, often being required by the credited writer of the TV shows to finish the writing. She adopted a gender-blind name just so her work wouldn't be dismissed outright. Once she landed with Gene Roddenberry, he was so impressed that he encouraged her to focus on her writing, and even helped her out of the administrative assistant pool and into a story editor position. Survival is the first of two Dallas episodes Fontana penned. We'll see her work again in season three's Dove Hunt. But one consistent through line in her work, regardless of how ridiculous the premise was, is the humanity of the characters. Unfortunately, Fontana passed in 2019 at the age of 80. The A plot of Survival is mostly a standalone, but a fine one. The B elements of the episode serve to fill in the blanks and will drive the story through most of the next 10 episodes. That's the perfect mix of action and lore and all that one can ask for from an episode.